welcome to another episode of TV Toastmasters. I'm Eric Bergman, your host, and tonight we have a special guest who's going to talk about how caregivers can take better care of themselves. We know caregiving is a very important job, but often one that is undervalued and underappreciated. And in fact, something along the lines of 43 million Americans are giving unpaid care to a loved one or family member in home. And if in fact they were paid for that work, it would cost more than $400 billion, according to recent statistics. So a lot of these unpaid but very caring caregivers are giving uh, our country and our culture a huge financial boost, yet it often takes a toll on them. To talk about professional as well as family caregivers, I have a guest tonight, a fellow Toastmaster, Rosetta Jansen. Let's meet her and start talking about caring for caregivers. Rosetta, thank you for being on TV Toastmasters. Thank you so much for having me. Now you have a, a long history of being a caregiver. You have been a certified nurse's assistant and have been an in-home care provider. Talk about how you got into this field and why it mattered to you. I have always been a caregiver. I grew up, it, it was something that was my little girl dream, I guess. Mm -hmm. I remember looking through, we had an old encyclopedia, and I would look through it before I could even read. <laughs> and there was this one page that captured my attention, and it was transparencies of the human body. And I would sit for hours and just flip through those pages. Those like, there were like five. And as, you know, building the human body and looking at all the body systems, and it was so fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. And I started working at a nursing home when I was 16 and a half. Really? <laughs> and wow. on my 17th birthday, I became a certified nursing assistant. <laughs> and so that began my career of caregiving. Really? That's from a very young age that you were into that. <laughs> yes. Now, this caregiving profession, it's so important, especially when we have generations like we do now, the baby boomers, the largest generation in American history, that is reaching senior citizen and above age. And yet, not a, peop not a lot of people think about what it means. So what, what did you gain, what, what's the good feeling or other benefits that you gain from this profession? How has that repaid you emotionally and psychically? It's probably a lot different than you think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have come to learn that it's when I go out and meet somebody, my energy is reflected in that other person. Mm -hmm. So when I go to a person's home and as I am working with them, it has fascinated me so much about when what my attitude is when I get to work mm -hmm. is the attitude that is reflected to, back to me in the people that I work with. So I have learned so much about myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it has been fascinating to learn so much about myself. And most people don't think of it in that aspect. They think of it in well, I'm just having a bad day. I don't know why I'm having a bad day. <laughs> yeah. And but a caregiver, a, a caregiver can't really afford to have a bad day because then you're putting your bad day on the person you're supposed to be nurturing and caring for, correct? Right, and that is really hard to do for a caregiver not to have a bad day. And so I've developed uh, one thing that I do before I go to work is I will think about my client 
or my patients and or my family member. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. What do I, what attitudes do I want them to exhibit? Or mm -hmm. basically what I'm doing is creating my life. But I'm, I'm just acknowledging that, you know, we're all one. I simply ask the universe to I ask the universe to just be, I thank the universe for expressing itself as my client. And then I will just say, a lot of times I'll say the person's name, you know, thank you that for this client's patience. Thank mm -hmm. you for this client's love and kindness. You know, thank you for this client's, a lot of times I work at night, so I'll say thank you for this client's perfect rest. And really feel that going, before I even get to work, you know, really feel that. And that sets the tone for my whole night or day. Now you try to approach each session each caregiving period with the approaching it with a good attitude and and you've mentioned one way that you get into it like acknowledging that you need to be in that good place what are some of the other things that you've developed to help you reach that good state with, with that I guess at ease with the universe so you can be at ease with the person who needs your help and is looking to you to provide some really often very personal things, uh, whether it's medicine, care, whatever. When I fly, it always amazes me that the flight attendant always says, put on your oxygen mask first yeah. <laughs> before you help anyone else. And I really have started taking that to heart. Mm -hmm. I have to fill up myself first before I can help anyone else. And how do I do that? Mm -hmm. There, I've started practicing meditation. That is like the ultimate way to fill yourself up. <laughs> and practicing little things of self-care. I used to be proud of how fast I could take a shower, in and out in a couple minutes. Mm -hmm. But then I started realizing I wasn't focusing on self-care. You know, I was focusing outside myself. So I started slowing down, taking a longer shower, and really using it to refill myself with goodness. Mm -hmm. And just remember to breathe. Breathing is that inspiration is the amazingness of the universe. It's the ultimate gift of the universe. Mm -hmm. So just taking care of yourself, literally in the, some of the simplest ways, can, can be a benefit to the caregiver. Now you mentioned how much you learned about yourself through the career of being a caregiver. Let's talk about what are some of the downsides? What are the things that you see in caregivers or have felt yourself that prevent you from being your best? Are we talking about depression, anxiety, other things? There's all of that. And often it comes from our home life. And that's the thing that we're bringing to work. Mm -hmm. And it's just coming out from all our pores, it seems like. <laughs> and I've had to focus on unconditional love. Mm -hmm. For example, one of the things that I have 
I, I see, especially in families where they're taking care of their own family, especially with dementia and Alzheimer's, where they will ask the same question like 55 times. And so many family members become so agitated. I told you that I answered that already. Can't you remember or why can't you remember? You know, well, they have Alzheimer's and dementia. Of course they can't remember. But it gets so frustrating for family members because they don't know how to answer the same question 55 times. <laughs> and so when I get into a place of unconditional love, and that takes releasing the ego mind and leading with my heart. Mm -hmm. And and when I started doing that, my whole outlook to caregiving completely changed. Because now I can have that patience that I need. I was in a nursing home that I was working at. There was a gentleman who moved very slowly. It hardly seemed he moved at all. Mm -hmm. And he couldn't respond. And so it, you know, some, my co-care workers, my co-caregivers, they would go in and, and, you know, just take the covers off and start messing around with him. And he would hang on to those covers like for dear life. And they got so frustrated because he wasn't, he wouldn't let go of the covers. And for myself, I never experienced that because when I went in, I showed him respect. I just said, this is what we're going to do. I treated him like any other person. And he released those covers with, it, it was like, it amazed me how different my approach was to how different someone else's approach was and how agitated they got when it was so simple for me. Great. Thank you. Well, we need to take a brief break. Stay with us for the second half of TV Toastmasters. Rosetta Jansen is here to talk about caregivers and how they can take better care of themselves. What do you learn in Toastmasters? Not just how to deliver a great speech. Not just how to be more confident when you do that. You learn the art, the craft of speech writing. People get paid a lot of dollars to write speeches for famous people. You can be one of those or you can just write speeches for yourself. But you can learn not only to deliver those speeches in Toastmasters, but to craft a well-written speech. What you write and what you say are sometimes different because the written word and the spoken word come across differently. So in Toastmasters, you learn how to craft a speech with a strong opening to catch that audience, a good body to deliver your message, and a closing to wrap it all together. You learn how to write that speech, deliver that speech, improve that speech with greater confidence. That is part of the package you get in Toastmasters. We're back again for more TV Toastmasters. Tonight we're talking about caregivers and how they can take better care of themselves. To address that topic, I have with me a fellow Toastmaster, Rosetta Jansen. She's a professional caregiver and she's also been a caregiver for her own family members. Rosetta, you have a two, point, two viewpoints on this. First of all, you give care as a career, as a paid yes. uh, caregiver, but you've also been caregiver for your own father and your sister. And yes. so many Americans will some point in their lives find themselves giving care whether they planned that or not, for a loved one. Talk about, if you could, what it was like caring for your father or your sister. It's very challenging for a family member to, to give care to, to another family member mm -hmm. because your roles change. For, a, for myself, being you know a daughter, taking care of my father, my father used to take care of me. Yeah. And now, all of a sudden, I'm having to take care of my father. That is a huge mind shift. 
how do I do that? And, you know, it, there again, you know, it comes down to really tapping into yourself and finding that unconditional love. Because even in the best of times, mm -hmm. you know, we lash out at the people we love the most. And when things aren't going well, then we really just tend to lash out. And it's nothing anybody can really do about it. It's, we're just all doing the best we can and trying mm -hmm. to deal with the circumstances. You know, it's coming from fear, from anxiety. Mm -hmm. You know, what's going to happen to my father? See, seeing him go through this is difficult. Mm -hmm. And seeing my mother go through it, too. And, Be and what were you treating? What was your father's condition? My father had Parkinson's. And you, you mentioned your mother also. Was she also in your care? No, but watching my mother try to take care of my father, because we oh, it was kind yeah. of a joint effort. Uh -huh, uh -huh. You know, I didn't live in the home. I just kind of went there periodically and tried to help out once in a while. But, you know, having seen my mother deal with it and trying to come in and help out, and it... It was very difficult. You know, at that time, I didn't have the tools emotionally that I do now. Mm -hmm. And so looking back, you know, I can see where I could have definitely done things differently. And the biggest difference would have been to come from a place of unconditional love, mm -hmm. tapping into my heart and saying, how do I care for my father? Not, how does it look? Making it, it, it almost felt like people were making fun of me because my father had an illness and I was just trying to take care of it and I mm -hmm. probably wasn't doing a very good job. And so there was, you know, fear on, you know, what was going on with my father, fear of what was going on with me socially and so, and he must have had fear too. What is this disease going to do to me? Absolutely. Can imagine his yeah. his freedoms were being taken away. He mm -hmm. was a house mover, and so he had he was he did all these amazing feats in his life, and now he couldn't even drive his own wheelchair. Wow! And that his freedom his Freedom was driving. He loved to just drive and see the, the scenery. And now that thing that he loved was being taken away from him. And mm -hmm. he didn't know what to do with himself. And that was probably the hardest thing, is watching those freedoms slowly dissolve. So when a person is caring for a family member, they may be putting in a half-time job on top of whatever else they're yes. doing. And if they reside with that person in the same home, you, they could spend more than 40 hours a week, according to statistics, caring for that person in all aspects, whether that's errands, shopping, clothing, bathing, giving medicine, just helping them through the day. That's a huge amount of time. And with a family member, of course, it's so personal because you know that person. You have long history with them. It, it's got to be very frustrating. And I, and I hear so many of the examples of caregivers who really felt their lives were negatively impacted, yet they felt it was their duty, their responsibility. Yeah. And they felt it very strongly that they didn't have much choice, tended to degrade the quality of their life. How do you work to keep your quality of life up under trying circumstances like this? When my sister, who has Down syndrome, lived with me, I finally had to ask for help. Mm -hmm. That was really hard for me to do. Yeah. 
I thought I was supposed to be able to do all of this by myself. So to ask for help was a huge step. Mm -hmm. But asking for help from a family or you know, a member of the community or another family member or somebody, you know, if you belong to a church or you know, a group of some sort, to ask for help from one of them. But not just, like for myself, my sister went to a workshop and once a week or a couple times a week there would be someone from the community who would c go pick her up for me. Mm -hmm. And that, that was huge, just that one little thing because it was like a half hour drive to go mm -hmm. pick her up. So just an hour in the day when I didn't have that responsibility was huge. Mm -hmm. And then to find someone to talk to. So many people think that, oh, I don't have to talk to anybody. anybody. I'm just going to suck it up and I'll be okay. Mm -hmm. And I have found that finding someone in the community, a friend, another family member, and if you don't have any of those, get a professional counselor. It's okay mm -hmm. to talk to somebody. Mm -hmm. Those are such great tips to, because the caregivers have to take care of themselves. Put on your own oxygen mask first Absolutely. so that you are able to help others. Now you, you have a couple things going on that I want to make sure we talk about. One is you have a booklet that you're offering for free to, to anybody who wants it with some of your tips on caregiving. Tell us how a person can get in touch with you for that. I have an email address, handbook for caregivers with an S at gmail.com. And that's the name of the booklet is Handbook for Caregivers. And if they just email me and say, hey, I want a, a booklet, I can send a PDF version of it at no cost. Great. A free PDF handbook for caregivers at gmail.com. Yes. And now you're wearing a piece of jewelry that has symbolism. Can yes. you talk about that briefly? We have about a minute left. Okay. This is what I call an affirmation chain uh, bracelet. This is my first design was something you can put in your pocket, but it has 11 beads, and 11 is the angel number that reminds us that our thoughts create a reality. So when I made my first one, I, just, I loved it so much, I just couldn't stop making them. <laughs> and then I came up with other designs, uh, like a necklace and a bracelet and a lanyard for a badge, um, and then just the original version of the pocket, the pocket affirmation chain. And it just helps me to remember that I am amazing. I have so much goodness inside of me, and to affirm all that goodness. Mm -hmm. So each bead, you can say an affirmation, reinforcing in you yes. so that you truly are embodying that positive message yes. as you go about your day. Well, Rosetta, it's been fascinating talking with you. I'm so glad you came on the air. Thank you. <clears throat> and you, we should tell everyone you're a member of Sayusala Tail Spinners. Yes. That's a Toastmasters club in Florence, <laughs> Oregon. And people can find information on the web about, about that club. Yes. Thank you so much. It's been great learning about caregivers and their role in American culture and, and how they can take better care of themselves. Thank you for being here. I'm Eric Bergman, your host. See us again on another episode of TV Toastmasters. Welcome to an opportunity to take the next step of your professional speaking journey. I want you to be honest with yourself. Have you ever wished you were a star in a television show or at an event where the media is interviewing bystanders and you are wanting to be picked to give your opinion of the event? Well, what if I can offer you a chance to be on TV? Would you take it? That is what I want to offer you now. I'm Dottie Love, Associate TV Producer and Director. District 7 is expanding your opportunities to do speaking via television. We have four fully equipped television studios and TV Toastmaster broadcasts to over 500,000 homes, plus a YouTube channel. Who knew? 
we want to invite you to take advantage of using media and television, either in front or behind the scenes. Let me share a few options that you have. First, you can be a guest on a show. Highlight your business or hobby or your community interest. Anything you're passionate about, be a featured guest. Secondly, you can train to be a host on an ongoing TV segment. We will train you for that. Third, what about creating your own talk show? We will train you in, for that as well and give you access to a community media studio to do just that. Or lastly, be behind the scenes, either running a camera or editing shows. You decide which avenue is best for you and our TV Toastmasters team will help you to navigate to get the most out of your media experience. Personally, I've done them all. I started as a guest, went from to hosting, up to directing my own TV show. I don't tell you this to impress you. I tell you this to impress upon you that your personal growth with Toastmasters is directly related to what you take advantage of. And I encourage you to be bold in looking for opportunities to stretch and grow. If this intrigues you, or if you have club members who you think that might be interested in this, please contact us here at TV Toastmasters. I'm Dottie Love, and you can reach me or any of us in the TV Toastmasters family at the contact information at the bottom of the screen. You can also find us on the web. Our website is 7512.toastmastersclub.org.